Hi, good afternoon and happy Saturday and happy Saturday room for all of us joining today. This is a very special broadcast of Writers on Writers over Triple Expresso. Uh, this is Patrick Greenwood, your wonderful host. We are deeply honored today and very happy to have Ravi Sheehan back. Ravi, how are you today? It's good to see you again. I'm very good. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I'm glad that you're here and very much so. And, and again, first of all, thank you for the time. And of course, I see your wonderful book over your shoulder. <laughs> very, very good prop. I love it. Uh, you're the wonderful author of the Tales from Another Dimension. And uh, I had a chance to read your book a couple of weeks ago. And I, I just in my in my review I wrote for you on Amazon, it reminded me of what it was like to write and read when I was 11 years old. It reminded me of just sitting down, you know, getting away from everybody and saying, I'm going to tune out. And I'm just going to just get lost in, in, in a book. And I have to tell you, it brought back wonderful memories. Um, as I was reading it, I'm thinking you and I are almost about the same age. I may be a little older than you. But <laughs> I started thinking about, God, where did this guy get his influence from? And then I kind of sneaked in and looked at your bio, and I saw a lot of familiar things. Dune, Guns of Navarone, <laughs> you know, oh, all yeah. these things. I'm like, wow, okay, so we have very likable taste in life. But knowing, uh, knowing your profession, I know you mentioned that you're in the quality part of uh, manufacturing. And you've been in the space almost 18, 19 years now. Um, how did you one day just say, you know what, I want to write. I want to I want to put this story down on paper. How did you kind of transform yourself from being that, you know, being in the manufacturing industry for so many years and saying, you know what, it's time I want to write a sci-fi. What was your journey to kind of become that? Um, you know, I, I've always had an imaginative mind. And, um, you know, I watch a lot of TV and a lot of movies mm -hmm. and I didn't read that much uh, as a kid. I didn't really start reading until I was in my late twenties. But mm -hmm. uh, just TV shows and movies, I would watch them, and I, you know, the, the end of the movie would come about, and I'd be like, "Wow, what if this guy did that instead?" You know, and I'm like, "That would be a great story." Or, "What if she did this instead of that?" <laughs> and and then that kind of, you know, gets the juices flowing, and uh, you know, that kind of inspired me to start. Hey, I, I, maybe I'll tr try starting to write. And of course, I'm. When I started out, I was not a, a writer at all. I wouldn't call <laughs> myself a writer. Maybe not even now. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, that's kind of what got me going. And of course, reading um, uh, classic sci-fi, uh, which I love, and that's kind of what I tried to get across in this in this book, Tales from Another Dimension. So I'm glad you, you did, liked it. You did wonderfully. And what I loved is the fact that every chapter kind of had a different story. Then you kind of loop back a little bit to other stories as you get further along down the book as well. Not giving too much spoilers to it, but one of the parts of the book that we talked about in the pre call was really kind of the influencing comments that you put about H.G. Wells. And for those of us that are of age, we do remember a lot of H.G. Wells, you know, and what really kind of inspired you to want to kind of reference him in his book? I mean, you could have done Orson Welles, you could have done 1984, you could have done George Orwell, you could have even done Gene Rottenberry from Star Trek, could have definitely been in this, or even Ross Steiger from you know, The Twilight Zone. But what compelled you to want to have so much reference about H.G. Wells in, in this book? Um, you know, it started out as kind of a, a funny journey because it started out, I, I began writing a story um, about the Black Death. And I kind of went into the history of that a lot, but it was fictional. And mm -hmm. it was about individuals living in London at the time dealing with the Black Death. And of course, that, that was because the pandemic broke out. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of similarities to uh, quarantining. And, yep. you know, in some countries, they, during pandemic, um, they, you know, they locked people in their houses. And, uh, and back in London, they did that too. They were like death houses. Mm -hmm. And that kind of got me thinking... And then, of course, it led to um, other historical things. And then it got me thinking about H.G. Wells. And mm -hmm. uh, many people, a lot of people, uh, when they think of H.G. Wells, they think, well, the Time Machine and War of the Worlds and exactly. there's a great sci-fi writer and um, writing way before his time. Um, but not a lot of people know that he also read wrote a lot of um, nonfiction work. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, um, you know, this book, The New World. Uh, mm -hmm. where he outlined a lot of human rights and the way humans should be treated and et cetera. So um, that's kind of, I thought, how cool would it be if H.G. Wells was in this fictional story and woke up, you know, 200 years in the future, what he would think of the world now? Like, yeah. I, I often think these, these sci-fi writers, they wrote at a time uh, where there wasn't, we hadn't been to the moon yet. You yeah. know, we didn't have the technology we had, yet they wrote about things in our time. 
I, I think of especially of uh, Isaac Asimov. You know, he was a great visionary and a predictor of, of the future. So, so I would, I would, I love that idea of H. G. Wells seeing how the world ended up and see how closely the things he wrote about came true. Um, not so much with War of the Worlds, but we're not being overrun by aliens. But um, so that's why I used him in this story, and of course, his aspect of the human rights. Um, I thought, how could I, how could I? write that into a story so um yeah it, it was an interesting journey for me you did beautifully and one of the things i really liked in your story again i, I promise not to give too much away because i want readers to really absorb your work but there was a piece in your book that talked about when the astronauts came back from space and that something wasn't right and back when the apollo program was first running here you know in in the united states back in the 60s and 70s when we had apollo 7 apollo 10 apollo 13 um, you know, no one back then even questioned the condition of the of the astronauts when they landed, right? And then you had the shuttle missions, and then suddenly everything stopped, right? Suddenly we no longer had any missions to the moon anymore, right? Did they find something? They discover something. So when I was reading your book, I was continuously looking up at the uh, moon, going, "Huh, maybe." <laughs> <laughs> and now we're sort of sort of restarting this whole moon thing again, and it's just sort of kind of scratched my head. I thought that was a wonderful way that you wrote into an additional like sci-fi that people forgot about that when we stopped going to the moon it, it either was a waste of money or maybe something else happened that no one ever really understood but i thought that was a really nice way that you depicted it as well when you were just mentioning hg while well, i talked about you know the rights of human dignity um i thought that towards the end of the book you, you wrote an extremely wonderful piece about the 1948 un charter on all the rights of human human humanity and it's interesting how if you read that today and you, and you compare that to 1948 and you see all the, I want to say, atrocities of what has happened to people as a result of war and famine, quarantining, right, economics, world growth, world expansion, you know, all the crap that we read every day. But it was interesting how the way that you depicted it is like, this is kind of what we thought the world needed to be. And yet we've gone so far away from that. And I really appreciated how you captured that in your book as well. Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, for those who haven't read it, I, I don't want to give too much away, but, you know, H.G. Wells in my story ends up on this mm -hmm. colonized planet and mm -hmm. and um, he's been, you know, frozen for 200 years. Um, mm -hmm. So he's kind of adapted into that. But there is a lot of discussion on, uh, you know, he, he slowly discovers mm -hmm. what has happened to Earth. Like right. if you wake up on another planet and you've been dead for three, uh, 200 years, you want to know, well, what happened to Earth? Right. So I kind of unpack that in the story mm -hmm. and, you know, how, his reaction to that. And even although the world he has been introduced to now on this colonized planet mm -hmm. um, is impressive, uh, mm -hmm. there's also that, you know, that feeling of, well, you know, what happened? What happened? That fell me in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's led down some different paths and he, he knows something's not quite right. Mm -hmm. Um so, uh, yeah, it, it was it was interesting writing that. Beautifully done. Now, one of the fun things that you did recently, which I, 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 I paced a compliment to you on, was in one of the social media postings. It showed you sitting with your laptop open. I think you may have had a coffee and you were kind of overlooking, you know, an outside sitting area as well. So every writer that I have a chance to come into face with every single day, everyone has a special writing spot. I mean, I have friends that are in Texas and different states that talk about, oh, I've got to get out of the house. I've got to go sit over here. Where is your perfect writing space? Where do you come up with your best creativity space? Um, you know what? It's not a place. It's uh, it's uh, an environment. If I have a quiet spot, um, I'll write anywhere. You know, whether it's I've I've written stuff in my car, um, <laughs> just because the the house is too noisy. The the animals are. It's like being in Noah's Ark, you know, and you can't find any 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 uh, quiet time. So I do write um, wherever I can and whenever I can. You know, Ray Brad Bradbury was a, a big fan of writing every day. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, we're not home every day or we're not in our favorite writing spots every day. So I, I go into a place, mm -hmm. uh, not a physical place, but I try to find, you know, those quiet spots where I can get a few pages down. <laughs> so are, are you a coffee shop drinking writer? Or are you more of a, I can't be in a place that has that much noise. You really have to put yourself in a, a nature isolation place to get most of your writing done. Mostly a, a nature isolation place. There's right. too much. It's not so much. It's not even just the noise. It's the, the visual 
schedule, people walking around and people people moving and things clinking and clanking um you know i kind of need i kind of need silence um mm-hmm. if i don't get the silence i find i have a lot more mistakes than i normally would <laughs> so i had the chance when i had a chance to read your book and i loved it especially i loved the cover i thought the cover was amazing um you. when you wrote it how many drafts how many edits how many betas how many, what was your writing process for you when you put this book together um, well, just to go back to the cover real quick, that was my buddy's 15-year-old son that done that. I think he was 15. No kidding. Yeah. Cassius, he's, uh, Cassius Sergeant. Yes, yes. And uh, a lot of the, the the detail in that are connected with the stories in the book. So you've got the robots up there. You've got mm-hmm. the two men in the middle at the bottom is H.G. Mm-hmm. Wells and this other character who we won't say uh, mm-hmm. his name or who he is. Um, well, it's a funny journey because the... The, originally, at the time, I was submitting all these stories to various uh, journals or mm-hmm. outlets, mm-hmm. And, and both uh, sci-fi and just general fiction, and even some non-fiction stuff. And um, although I got a couple of them accepted, um, I still had all these sci-fi stories, and I thought, why, why don't I just compile them all into this collection, and I'll publish mm-hmm. them? Mm-hmm. So, so that's what I'd done. Um, you know, I, I maybe had four or five of them mm-hmm. um, already written, um, multiple drafts of each one. <laughs> um, and I sent them out to be edited, each one. Mm-hmm. And I know it gets expensive. And um, over time, I had, you know, at the time I had seven or eight stories. And mm-hmm. I thought, that's probably enough. I'll just do the eight. And then a friend at work said, Could, you got to give us 10. Uh, you can't just have eight. So I... Um, Threw together another two stories, and uh, that's how we got got the ten stories. And like I said, two of them, um, the truth comes in storms, which is the first story in the book, uh, that was actually accepted for publication in a, a magazine a few years ago. And then um, there was another one, uh, danger. I forget what it's called. Um, mm-hmm. Dangers of atmospheric entry Mm -hmm. that was also published in an an anthology Mm -hmm. so um yeah so um that's how the 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 collection came together so the editing and i I smirk on the editing because every writer i've had on if you've watched a few of my podcasts that you know that the editing everyone just kind of cringes when you worked with the editor and i'll and i'll share a story of mine as well when i was working with editors i had technically i didn't know any better i had four editors two of them were claimed to be editors and turned out to be nothing more than glorified proofreaders that didn't really do anything. One actually put a paragraph or not even a paragraph, a line sentence in the first paragraph saying build on it. And that was their total contribution for $600. When wow. you worked with the editors, did you find them to be a very open and collaborative or did you find them being more like the fifth grade teacher that was bleeding all over your paper? Um, well, sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, the, I, I had a couple of editors that had they either done um, uh, 80% of the stories or I had one editor check the story and then I had somebody else do it um, mm-hmm. just for, you know, I, I was new to this at the time and I'm still relatively new. Um, mm-hmm. But they were good. They, they gave me a lot of feedback um, on the structure of, of the various stories. Of course, all the grammar and spelling mistakes. Um, and and as we've as we talked earlier, and you've talked about on your on your previous podcast, do you get the idea of the story? Never mind. Yeah. I didn't yeah. put a period in there, or I have a, a run on sentence. You know, um, so uh, which I'm awful at. Uh, my wife will attest to that. Um, but yeah, they, they they gave me a lot of good feedback, and um, you know they they did it through Word doc, so they had all the notes at the oh, side and. Good. Uh, yeah, and they said, you know, you should try to word it this way, or you should think about this scene, or whatever. So it it was it was helpful, and I definitely recommend getting stuff uh, finding a good editor and uh, have them look over your work. Marketing is always another subject I love talking about with writers. <laughs> I get a lot of comments on that. Yeah, but, but no, I love I love the prop that that it actually works. I My didn't prop. even know they were there. They just appeared there. I yeah, don't know I'm what to sure say. You, five minutes before we went on, I'm sure you're like, "What well, do I need to put this over my left shoulder?" Yeah. <laughs> but I have to tell you that marketing is one that comes up a lot in these podcasts, and it's interesting to hear stories of people that, you know, how did you first get notoriety? How did you first get your name out there? What was the 
th first three months of your marketing strategy, to, just to get somebody to even look at your book? Um, well, I had some posters made. Um, you know, I was, uh, uh, you know, I heard a, a, a rumor about Tom Clancy, and I don't know how true this is, but he would had a box of books in his back of his car, and he would just peddle them to people. Um, and I, I don't know how true that is, but uh, I've heard other writers saying that that they just yeah. they just gave out books, they pushed books, they, you know, on friends and family, and then strangers, and um, I really done you know, tried hard at that. And, you know, nobody's going to do it for you. You you have to get out there and promote yourself. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you don't want to bug people and you don't want to be one of those people uh, that's just pushing, pushing, pushing. Uh, but to a certain extent, you kind of do because otherwise you're just, you just get the, the, the you, you know, it's so saturated, uh, the, the, the market with all these different stories and books. Mm -hmm. And it, it just seems like everybody's writing. Yeah. And there's all this content out there and um, you kind of have to try and set yourself apart. So I had posters made. I had, you know, um, book cards made. So on the, the front of my card, it was my book cover. And on the back, I had QR code, which okay. took me to my website. Very yeah. Cool. And, um, you know, then I had a call to action in the book, you know, visit my website and leave me a review, please. Reviews make us <laughs> better writers. So um and that is a big deal. If you have a bunch of reviews and, and people go to Amazon to, to see your book and they're like, wow, look, you know, you get 50 reviews. There's 50 people that uh, hopefully all of them are good, but, um, you know, 50 people have recommended this. So there's got to be something there, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah it, it's, it can be tough. It can be tough. Have you done book? Did you do any book fairs? Did you do any like library readings? And, and I have a story with that. I'll tell you in a little moment. But it, did you do a lot of any of those types of events? Um, I didn't, but I hope to maybe next summer with my, my new book out. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I have, I did, I had a master plan. I wanted to, to have various things published in mm -hmm. journals and, and, um, various outlets, um, leading up to this. Mm -hmm. And I, because I always wanted to publish a book, mm -hmm. but, but I didn't know it was going to be this one. So whenever something was published online, in my mm -hmm. bio, I would always draw attention to upcoming book. Mm -hmm. And I didn't give a detail, but, and mm -hmm. I tried to kind of build a following there and, um, you know, networking and, and reaching out and meeting people and, hey, do you mind plugging my book, you know? So um, <laughs> there was a lot, there was a lot of that too. And then these wonderful podcasts by wonderful people like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. But one thing that's really, you know, and I appreciate that about the marketing part, because I think having you drive a lot of your, your pieces of work through journals as building a, a name or a brand for yourself and then having that eventually correlate to your consolidations of all, of all your stories into a single book. And it sounds like that you're setting up very nicely for your second one without giving away too much of next summer's release. Um, are you currently self-publishing right now? Are, are you using your own label? Are you using uh, what, what's kind of been your, your ability to bring your book to market? Um, well, Tales from Another Dimension is self-published, but um, I, I didn't want, I have nothing against Amazon, they're awesome, but I didn't want Amazon being on my book anywhere. So um, I had to purchase um, my own uh, ISBNs. Um, so I got those, and then because I had that, so some advice to writers out there who self-publish. If you self-publish on Amazon, and I had to watch a lot of YouTube videos and learn all this because, like I said, not a lot of people are going to help you out. When you publish on Amazon and you use that free ISBN uh, that they give you, um, it's an identification for, you, for your book. If you use theirs, then they can put Amazon on your book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not as attractive if it says Amazon on it. So if you purchase your own ISBN, then mm -hmm. you can pretty much put anything you want on there. So I put Silly Lily Publishing because that's my, my daughter. <laughs> I noticed, yeah, I noticed that. That was like, <laughs> yeah, I got to put my daughter's stamp on there somewhere. So it's Silly it. Lily Publishing. And that just looks a little more attractive than Amazon um, mm -hmm. being on your book. So it's just a little, you know, it's all these little things that you have to do that, that kind of build up to where you want to be, you know?
Was there a was there a value in putting it up on Amazon? Did you get get any pull? Did you get you know any references or or people writing nice reviews of you? Or is it really more just a platform and you could have put it on Ingram Spark or you could have put it anywhere else that you wanted? But did you find that being on Amazon was a help to you, especially early on? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think Amazon is an unbelievable platform. I mean, anybody can write something and put it up there. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not special, and um, it, it, it involves a lot of research and doing it right because um, it can be frustrating. And I kind of heard that through um, various people about Ingram Sparks can be difficult, um, and also also the you know Amazon provides up data every 24 hours right. so if if you do a promotion you can then see your data for the last 24 hours mm -hmm. and see how that promotion done whether it didn't done good or it done bad or say you do a book signing and you have people they want to buy your your ebook mm -hmm. amazon is a great platform for checking data whereas ingram sparks i believe is 90 days before you get any numbers so how, how mm -hmm. can you it's hard to market a book when you don't mm -hmm. see the data for 90 days afterward. But yeah, I, Amazon is great. Amazon. And everybody uses Amazon. I mean, yeah. everybody's on Amazon. Everybody has Prime. You know, so. <laughs> that is true. Uh, yeah. And plus the fact that you also get to do the unlimited when you're getting your Kindle book into that. Yeah. I've heard that that's been some pretty good successful stories as well. If yeah. you're taking your book tomorrow and you go out like Tom Clancy used to do where he had a truckload of them in the back and he used to like, hey, here it is, here, sign this. Um, when you're talking about the next book, do you plan on doing any pre-marketing differently than you did for your first book? Do you have something in mind to kind of get a little bit out ahead of it? Or do you think you'll just kind of do the same process you did when you released the first one? Um, you know, like you said earlier, I have a full-time job. I have a family. Um, you know, I'm not uh, one of these retired guys that can just, you know, go out and go on these book tours and nothing against them. But if you have the time, that's great. Um, but I don't really have the time. So I may just do uh, what I what I done with, you know, the book. And also, you know, hopefully people that read Tales from Another Dimension mm -hmm. will want something else. Yes. Um, you know, so and and my next book will be a little different. Um, so uh, hopefully, hopefully it's. I mean, I think Tales from Another Dimension. I'm happy with it, and it's releasing, mm -hmm. and the people that have read it, um, I, it doesn't have to be a bestseller. So mm -hmm. if I can get the same success, then I'm happy. You know, well, I got to tell it's you, you full time you, job. So no, no, <laughs> I mean it's an amazing book. But one of the things I always wanted to, you know, to just tell you since I've known you is you would do an excellent audiobook. If you ever decide to do an audiobook with your accent and your voice and your and your positive enthusiasm, you could do your own audiobook. Yeah. So maybe maybe the next one is the next one possibility yeah. of being an audio? Is that possible? Possibly. I I, I would have to become a better reader. Uh, I don't think my my accent, my wife always says uh, it, it it doesn't matter how he reads, people aren't listening. It's just the accent they care about. Exactly. Um, but I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Well that I, again Great compliment to not only the book. I loved it. I'm looking forward to the next one as well. How can people get hold of you? What is the best way that they can acquire your book? Um, they can go to um, Amazon and search my name or search for Tales from Another Dimension. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could visit my website, um, which is uh, talesfromanotherdimension.com. Um, I may change that in the future, but right now that's the name of it. And you can find out some information about me. You can find a link to my book, and there's also links on there to other um, little pieces that I've published uh, out in the world, out in the void. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you do read the book and you've read the book, please leave a review. Uh, that would no, be awesome. I, I and, and share it with your uh, hundreds of thousands of Twitter uh, <laughs> followers that you people have. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I have to tell you, I'm a big fan of your book. Big fan you. of how you, you started and how you ended it. I love the reference to the UN Charter. Uh, obviously, the issue also is very sacred to my heart because I, I'm a big Gene Roddenberry fan from going back in Star Trek. I mean, now we now have phasers. We now have lasers. We, we don't have transporters yet, but we got <laughs> communicators now. we got a communicator in our watch. I mean, it, 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 this, the visionary people, you see their stuff 50 years later. You know, the stuff is now showing up as mainstream as well. Robbie, first of all, thank you very much for making time on an extra special day on Saturday, especially late in the evening on your side. 
Um, always a pleasure and look forward to staying in touch with you and, and look forward to having you on when the next book comes out as well. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been uh, fun talking to you. Absolutely. Everyone, thank you for making on this week's special of Writers and Writers over at Triple Expresso. This is Patrick Greenwood, your host. Stay safe, stay happy, and we'll see you on next Saturday as well. Take care. <laughs>